Um, welcome everyone to uh, the session on engaging with communities to prevent violence against women in localised settings. We've got a star-studded lineup um, for you tonight, so I'll, I'll get the stars to introduce themselves in, in more detail as we go through. But before I um, go any further, I just want to acknowledge that we're meeting on the traditional lands. I'm coming to you from the traditional lands of the uh, people of the Kulin Nation, particularly the people of the Wurundjeri um, language group in Melbourne. And I want to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging leaders. And I also want to acknowledge that this land has never been ceded. Um, so I also want to pay my respects to um, Indigenous peoples on whichever lands you're meeting on tonight. Um, for those of you who, would, who don't understand what I'm saying already and would like prefer this to be in Spanish, we have the option of having this session interpreted in Spanish. So if you go to the bottom of your screens, there should be a global icon which says interpretation. If you click on that, you have the option of um, hearing this conversation in Spanish. Um, just a tiny bit of context before we um, kick off with the speakers. Uh, in the state that we're living in, all the speakers here tonight are living in, which is Victoria in Australia, there's been quite a radical transformation in, in the prevention of violence against women over the last decade or so. Uh, many of us have been working in the field for many years, but in the last decade, um, there was a Royal Commission, which was a big inquiry by the state government into family violence after a, some high profile um, attacks on women and, and murders of children and women in, in Victoria. And that Royal Commission resulted in 227 recommendations, all of which were adopted by the state government. And there was half a billion dollars of funding that was put into the Victorian community to try to um, stop violence against women. Um, so some of these projects may have tapped into that, into that um, pool of money, I'm not exactly sure, but they'll, they'll talk about that and the evolution of that of their projects as we go along. So the very first speaker that I'd like to um, go to is the wonderful Colleen Turner. Um, so Colleen, I'll, I'll throw to you, you can introduce more about yourself and about your project. Sorry, sorry folks. Um, I hope I'm unmuted now. Um, like Peter, I want to um, pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land. Um, what I also wanted to do was introduce myself very briefly, throw to Shayanti, my co-producer. She can introduce herself very briefly, then back to me, and then about halfway through, we'll swap. That's how we're going to go. Um, so I'm Colleen Turner. I've been a community psychologist for a very long time and now I'm retired. So exciting. Um, but I hope in retirement that I can do some good things, particularly around climate change and young people. Um, but prior to retiring, I worked for VicSeg New Futures. No, I'm not going to tell you what the acronym is. It takes too long. Um, and uh, one of the one of the great projects I worked on was this one, which is a um, both both a research and action research and um, empowerment project for immigrant women and their young children, children under five. So, Shanti, do you want to say something? Thanks, Colleen. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Shayanti Bhatta, and I work as the Northern Programs and Services Manager at Vixig New Futures, a not-for-profit community organization based out of Melbourne. And I've been really fortunate to have worked with Colleen on this wonderful project. Uh, and it is still, we still have funding for it till about March next year. Uh, that's pretty much in a snapshot about uh, um, myself and this project, and I will now start sharing our presentation and Colleen, uh, you can take over from here. Okay, waiting for presentation. I think we call this one, Playing the Equality Game. Um, we call that because of one half of the project, which is about, it's, a, it's a, an absolutely primary prevention program for women, immigrant women broadly speaking, so women who might be refugees, newly arrived immigrants, people from communities who've been here longer, all the, all the various subsects of that, and their um, very small, that is under, under five-year-old children. We've used a playgroup platform. Um, 
I'm not sure if everybody knows what a playgroup is because in different countries and some people are psychologists and not community workers. So a playgroup is where women, primarily women, but parents and their children come together um, and share, share fun and games for a couple of hours each week. Um, everybody wins because women make friends, men who fathers who are there too make friends, the children make friends with each other, it's socialising, it's a good platform for adding information and, um, and information and supports. So uh, it's my long held belief that all playgroups are but in and of themselves a prevention of family violence platform. Next one, Shanti. Okay, so the goal of this particular project, which is an add on to um, or oh, it depends on how many every year, it's a different number, but the up to 30 playgroups that FixEgg runs in the northern and western suburbs of Melbourne, where there are a lot, a lot, a lot of newly arrived immigrant families and communities. So the pilot, I'm just going to read now, the project is to empower women from diverse communities to talk about um, how their partnerships are influenced by their culture and how the joy and stress of early parenting affects um, personal relationships. So we know that that pregnancy and early childhood are higher than normal risks for domestic family violence. So it's a good time to have this sort of intervention. Um, the groups have been, what one of the things they've done is been encouraged to explore how, how the domestic violence system, how the education system, and you know how things work in Australia because many of them are very newly arrived and some of them are quite isolated. Um, and because it's an action research project, people can go around a couple of loops to, to focus in on the particular things that they're interested in each group. Next one. Um, so the research component um, was a participatory action research methodology. And it aimed to ask women, you know, what's a respectful relationship? And of course, when you ask anyone what's a respectful relationship, you spend a bit of time talking about what's a respectful relationship and then some time on what's not a respectful relationship. Um, and then the second thing we asked them was, well, how do you bring up children? How do you, how do you bring up children within that relationship and with the overlay of your particular culture? Next one. So the project has so far involved up to 600 women over four years and from a range of cultural backgrounds. And you can read the various cultural backgrounds there. Um, next one. So, semi, so the way we did it, the way we did the research component was to have those conversations fairly early in the project, but we roll them around again because each year different 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 families are involved in the playgroups and so you can have the same conversations a few times. Um, and so, so mostly it was held in um, participants' first language, all of the above first languages, but some multicultural playgroups were held in English. Next. Um, so the results about the, the conversations about how to bring, how to have a respectful relationship and how to bring children up together in that respectful relationship. These are the kinds of broad things we've found so far. Um, okay, open communication. None of these are terribly, terribly surprising and none of them are terribly, terribly rocket science, but they do suggest that, um, that whilst communication might mean different things to different individuals to different and different cultural communities, there is, there is a broader kind of thing you can take from it. So um, open communication, respect, shared values. Um, and the shared values thing is really interesting when you're talking about how to bring up children and we'll get onto it, that in a moment. So then we extended the project a little to to engage the kids in the group um, and we got some we got some experts to um, include the, the preschool children who were you know accompanying their their parents and some of them were babies so they weren't all that active in the conversation but some of them were four and a half or five 
um, about gender equity and gender equality within the um, cultures. And the, the video that Shant is going to show in a minute um, demonstrates just how that might work. Next. Thanks, Colleen. I'm now going to share with you a video which was made by Vexag New Futures and the project worker at that point of time. Three groups offer a flexible platform engaging oh, minors and young volume. families and their children as part of the regional place-based early intervention and prevention response. They are a safe, welcoming space for women and young children. Wixfix supported culturally specific places target newly arrived, socially isolated, vulnerable families. Our playgroups are facilitated by early childhood staff members who are from the same culture and linguistic community as the playgroups they are facilitating, providing extensive support to families by building linkages between families and a wide range of services in the community. Wixfix aims to build strength safety, and well-being of families in places. Critical issues of interests are identified by the women in playgroups, knowing in more detail particular concerns, support of playgroup coordinators approach to right agencies in providing information and support on complex issues uh, which sometimes include family violence and its impact on health and well-being and women and women um, they can share from information from situations with their friends and families. They always come to the playgroup where they feel it's a safe place. So they share it with, with the, in their playgroup. And if they can't, they always come to uh, us as uh, facilitators. We say playgroup facilitators and coordinators attend regular professional development trainings to better assist their playgroup families and also to gain information on the services in the community. Vixic playgroup facilitators are well trained in evidence based prevention programs where we are in a position to train and develop programs beyond their days to future playgroups. Vixic has worked with families from a wide variety of backgrounds and found the playgroups to be very valuable as a mechanism for women and their young children to become included in their local communities. Playgroups support inclusion in education, in pathways to employment and to health information and prevention. All of these are effective strategies in the prevention and early intervention. Playgroup is a good platform for women to uh, help each other and support each other. All right. Uh, well, I'm just going to talk to you about the project now and some of the outcomes that we've seen from the delivery point of view. Here at VixEG, we are really fortunate to work with a wide range of women from a wide range of backgrounds who bring with them lots of strengths, skills, abilities, and uh, when our facilitators went in to have these conversations with the women from sometimes their own cultures and the playgroups, I've seen them really being challenged, their thinking being challenged, their beliefs and value systems being challenged. And uh, many of them acknowledged uh, quite a few times that it is not absolutely easy to have these conversations in the playgroups with the women. Uh, there are lots of issues and then there are disclosures, which uh, made us really think and focus on the fact that we had to uh, absolutely uh, focus on the capacity building of our bicultural staff. So a lot of training and workshops were organized not just around uh, family violence, gender equality, but also around group facilitation skills, which have been really wonderful. And looking ahead, like I said at the very beginning, the project is funded only till March next year, but I'm very sure that the capacity of the bicultural staff being built, I'm confident that we will be having more of these conversations uh, in different settings, uh, whether it be play groups, social support groups, or women's groups. Of course, the other thing, uh, if we are having these conversations in the play groups, there might be triggers, women might be disclosing, and then 
for us as the organization, as the program uh, coordinators and managers, it was really important to have policies and procedures in place so that these disclosures can be handled uh, effectively and our facilitators did not feel compromised, did not feel uncomfortable or did not uh, feel unsupported. Uh, as a result, we of course saw a lot of uh, disclosures happening and increased referrals to family violence specialist services. Uh, the other thing that Colleen uh, briefly touched upon was the fact that uh, not only did we have these roundtable discussions in the playgroups, we also invited a range of uh, guest speakers into the playgroups. And they were like uh, people from Victoria Police who talked about women's rights in Australia, the laws around family violence, the kind of support Victoria Police can offer to women. Then there was the legal center again, talking about women's, women's rights, uh, the pathways uh, into, different, into the refuge system if anybody needed to leave the house. And then there was uh, the specialist family violence service workers who provided more in-depth uh, knowledge and awareness to the women. So, of course, these were some of the really good outcomes of the project as well. And I believe uh, that has immensely been helpful for the entire team across the North and the West, wherever we've been uh, having uh, running these projects so far. So this uh, beautiful picture that you see is actually from... Uh, uh, one of the other things that we started doing, looking at gender equity since last year, the focus has been on gender equality. And we partnered with Drummond Street Services, another community organization based out of Victoria, along with Playgroup Victoria, who have developed this beautiful model of a 45 minute musical fun interactive session, which can be facilitated in a playgroup setting, wherein we talk about gender equality, introduce the concepts. And I think you saw it in the videos as well. Children were uh, given dolls, both boys and girls got a chance to change the nappies with a little bit of poo in it, which was fun. And uh, of course, there were lots of musical instruments. Uh, and the concept was, uh, basically the narrative was around um, a mother who's a doctor and a father who is a stay at home dad. So literally breaking down the gender stereotypes and looking at uh, how to flip it over, get the children to think uh, that these are just not the norms, not, you know, how they have, how they should be culturally or otherwise conditioned. Uh, but, you know, everybody having a choice to be whatever they want to be. So in 2020 as well, the focus on gender equality has continued and uh, till the pandemic struck, we have been successfully able to, and we have of course trained up our facilitators in this uh, beautiful all come out to play uh, model as well so that they can facilitate these sessions in their playgroups themselves. Uh, we had around six all come out to play sessions in our playgroups um, up to March this year. And then we went into lockdown and all of our face-to-face -face sessions uh, had to, of course, be cut back. We quickly transitioned onto the online platform and started having online Zoom playgroups, which were usually uh, for around half an hour to 40 minutes based on the needs of the group. And during this period of pandemic, the playgroup facilitators really played a very important role in staying connected with the families, doing regular welfare checks, finding out whatever their needs were, and giving them the most important and relevant information. Thanks, Sahanti. We're going to have to um, wrap that one up just so we can fit other presentations Absolutely. in. Was there a final point you wanted to make? Um, I think I just wanted to maybe end by saying that uh, the project, uh, as I said, would be ending up soon, but we have enough uh, evidence and enough capacity built of our staff for it to uh, continue in certain ways and have these conversations happening because they are really, really important to make uh, the change happen from the grassroots level itself. Thank you so much. So, thank you, um, thank you very much to Sahanti Bata and Colleen Turner for um, sharing that project. I forgot to say at the start that if you have questions, we'll be saving them to the end of the, of the three presentations. So please put your questions in the chat um, space and uh, we'll address them as we go through. Thank you so much. I am going to go next to Dr. Kim Shearson from Victoria University to talk about the Momentum Project. Over to you, 
Kim. Oh, the other thing I just need to say for other people who don't wonder what that bell is, um, when there's three minutes to go, I've, I ring a bell, and when the, uh, the second bell is when it's time to finish. Thanks. Over to you, Kim. Thanks for that, um, Peter. I'm an academic at uh, Victoria University and my um, research interest is in primary prevention of um, family violence. I will be discussing the evaluation of Project Momentum, which was an initiative to engage young men as allies in primary prevention of violence against women work. <laughs> This work was conducted with two honours students from Victoria University, uh, Miss Amy Livingston and Daisy Bottomley, who did a wonderful job uh, and we had a great time working together. Traditionally, masculinity is associated with dominance, physical strength, power and control. Adherence to these traditional gender norms facilitates the development and maintenance of violent supportive attitudes, which in turn contributes to the perpetration of violence against women. Therefore, gender equity is a key feature of primary prevention work. Community mobilization calls on all members of the community, including men, to contribute to the eradication of violence against women. The importance of engaging men in preventing violence against women um, initiatives has been recognised for many years. With the recognition that men influence each other's attitudes came the understanding that men are well positioned to challenge violent supportive beliefs and promote positive messaging to other men. Therefore, men are crucial to the gender equity movement. On the one hand, we can see the benefits of male allies. However, involving men carries a risk of reproducing male power and privilege. Therefore, formalized gender accountability mechanisms are needed to correct, correct unequal power dynamics that may arise. Men working in primary prevention should be accountable to women and women's voices should remain the primary consideration. Project Momentum aimed to prevent violence against women and their children by engaging young male students and staff as male allies to develop and implement primary prevention strategies in their local communities or in the university setting. Each initiative needed to have a focus on gender equality. This was a collaborative project between a university and a community agency. It employed community engagement and mobilization strategies. It also incorporated accountability to women in the project design. The elements of project momentum, uh, recruitment to completion was approximately 12 months. Five young male allies were recruited to develop extracurricular projects. They had two violence against women training sessions and one project management session. Mentorship by a female project manager um, was provided throughout the time of the project. Three female peers were recruited to an accountability panel and they received one training session. And the uh, male allies presented their projects to a panel, to the panel and a group of female stakeholders, after which the projects were implemented. And you can get more information about Project Momentum and the resource toolkit that was um, uh, an end product through the Healthwest organization uh, website. Allies planned diverse projects to address or highlight gender equity. They included promoting women's participation in sport and umpiring, using creative writing to explore notions of masculinity, addressing the gap in education about gender inequality in the workplace, and the Burundi Community Drumming Project, uh, which aimed to raise awareness of women's exclusion from cultural practices 
in the Burundi diaspora in Melbourne. The final joint project brought all the allies together to produce an interactive art installation which encouraged men to reflect on the pressure to adhere to stereotypical masculine ideals. Our evaluation aimed to, to assess project implementation with a strong focus on ally development as well as short-term outcomes. We used a case study approach to explore the project from multiple perspectives. This included observation of training and of the accountability panel review, focus groups and individual inter interviews at various time points across the project, as well as project documentation and participant reflections. And we used thematic analysis for qualitative data analysis. The first finding concerned the value of training. Male ally training in relation to the drivers of violence against women enhanced awareness and understanding. It was described as eye-opening and life-changing. The project management training session, uh, the, in, through that the allies developed a project plan uh, which became a valuable tool for them throughout their projects. And as the allies described, before the training, I wouldn't have seen that. I wouldn't have had a cl any clue what was going on. I would have just continued with the conversation or not even acknowledged that she was being completely thrown out of the entire discussion. The men's experiences throughout their individual projects further increased their awareness as they witnessed gender inequity and male privilege during the implementation stages of their projects. These experiences exposed the men to a broader understanding of the many ways in which gender inequality can persist throughout daily interactions. The initial training paired with the project manager's mentorship ensured that the men recognised and learned from these instances. As one ally described this in his attempt at community consultation, I went into the home and we gathered on the good couches and we said all the women go to the backyard and the kitchen. So we were seen as very important and official people. On that day I nearly cried. Project participation engendered ongoing commitment to challenging gender stereotypes and promoting gender equality. All the allies described how they wanted to continue to advocate for gender equality. They also recognised that change is slow and perseverance is needed. But they may join this year or next year, we are here. So the good news, we are not here for a short time, we are here for a long time. So if this year I can manage to recruit five and the next year another five, then in 10 years, how many? And as another ally said, I have to admit my judge of character has definitely changed based on the project itself. And that's really made me want to be proactive in being an ally still. Stakeholders who became involved in ally, ally projects and community participants who participated in the individual projects also gained awareness and were mobilised. Influential men transitioned from ambivalence to active interest and then to enthusiastic support. At the start, at the start all he said was, yeah, all right, why should I care? Good for you, good luck. And then he was coming up to me every day, talking to me about how VU's going, how the academy's going, what's happening. He started gaining interest and now he's supporting it and he's more than happy to help out. So this was based on the um, umpire training for women. And uh, the, the ally was talking about um, someone who had a quite powerful um, position in, in uh, umpiring. The participants in the various 
uh, activities also gained awareness. A number of strategies we use to embed accountability to women. Strong female leadership was crucial. Labelling the men as allies rather than as project leaders sent an important message. Allies were accountable to the female project manager throughout. And she recognised that important role that she had. It was at times um, that I had to sort of say, well, we'll challenge that or I'll hold the line on that. The men were encouraged to speak with and listen to women and consider the inequalities they face in their everyday lives. As one ally said, the female friends I had in engineering, saying how hard it was in university and just feeling uncomfortable in class. So that really gave me insight. If you were a female coming into engineering, would it be as easy as it is for men to come into it? Young women wanted more involvement and training. Um, these are the young women that were on the accountability panel, but they benefited from the project manager as a role model, again, emphasizing the importance of that strong female leadership. As one panel member said, I'm a little bit in awe of her because she's so super strong and just sort of sit back and learn from her. But the women wanted to uh, work on the projects. They wanted to be on the ground doing the projects rather than taking on that leadership role. Um, and another interesting finding around the uh, accountability panels uh, attitude to the project is that they were um, quite reluctant to be critical in the panel review. They were concerned about negatively impacting the allies' commitment to the cause. Um, so they might find it too confronting, they might get annoyed, they might find that they're being patronised. So in a way, those young women were putting those men on a little bit of a, a pedestal just for the fact that they were men engaging in this uh, type of work. But this indicates that we still have a long way to go in empowering young women to take the lead and find their voice. And this will be crucial moving forward to ensure men work as true allies in primary prevention of violence against women work. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for your time. And I'd just like to thank Health West Partnership for the opportunity to undertake the project. Thank you so much, Kim. Again, if people have got questions, um, please put them in the chat and we'll, we'll get to them at the end. Our final um, presentation this series uh, comes from Catherine Diasi and Olivia Stevenson on uh, taking action in our community. So I think I'll go to you first, Catherine, then you can um, introduce Olivia when you need to switch over. Thank you. Hi, I'm Catherine Darcy and I'm Health Promotion Officer at EACH and I'm going to be presenting today with Olivia Stevenson um, and we're going to be talking about our learnings from a program that's focused on mobilising communities to take action on gender equality in the outer east of Melbourne. So you um, can see from this slide the number of partners involved including the councils each as a community health service, EDBOS, which is a crisis service, Women's Health East, and CHAOS, which is a community house network. Thanks, Olivia. So just talking a little bit about the program before I do go to this slide, the program starts with the partnership and the partnership's called Taking Action in Our Community. Um, and the focus of that partnership program. So we, we see the partnership as being a long-term piece of work um, and this has just been the first year of that partnership work um, but the focus of all of our partnership work is supporting community houses to mobilise their own local communities. So the idea is to have a, a regional approach because community houses exist in each of the neighbourhoods of the outer, outer east and community houses have that connection with local communities and chaos 
as the overarching organisation that connects with the community houses is able to coordinate that work across the region. So part of our focus in doing that is wanting to start from a ground, ground up to be looking at what a model of community mobilisation could look like in an Australian context. So while there are community mobilisation models that are out there, a lot of them were developed in other regions. So just moving to this slide now. So the, this talks about um, the theory that informs community mobilisation for prevention of violence against women. And I think of all the different images that I've seen about this, this one captures it really beautifully. And it comes from a, um, an article in The Lancet by Laurie McCaw and her colleagues. And what we see in this diagram is community is one of the layers in that socio-ecological model that we're, if we're really going to truly make a difference on family violence rates, on violence against women rates in the community in the long term, we actually need to intervene across all the levels of the socio-ecological model. And community engagement, community mobilization is a key part of that work. And that's what we're working, that's the theory that we're working on in the Outer East. Thanks, Olivia. So the focus of taking action in our community is at its core on partnerships. So the partnership includes all the councils, as I've said, each Ed Boss, and at the centre of the partnership is the community houses. So Chaos is the key partner, and their work is really to coordinate those um, community houses to be able to all be working across the region in that local mobilisation role. Thanks, Olivia. So this gives an idea of the, the activities that we did as, as part of the first year of getting this partnership moving. So in the first year of the partnership, we started off with engaging with community houses across the region. We used promotions, we particularly um, used chaos. So chaos was the key focus in getting the promotions out to the houses. We put out through those promotions, a call for expressions of interest for the houses to participate. And we provided a thousand dollar grant for each of the houses that wanted to participate. We also connected them up with mentors from the partnership. Um, and we ran quite a few workshops that brought the houses together to train them, um, to give them the theory and to connect them up to the kind of actions and work that we were doing in the region through the Together for Equality and Respect partnership which was also occurring at the same time so it was really connecting the houses into that regional work. Um, at the centre of the training that we taught them in and the resources we had something called the gender equality clothesline kit which had been put together by one of the houses um, in one of the local regions previously and, the and that template gave them a set of steps that they could all follow but that which they could adapt to their local communities. Um, and also out of that training, the houses said they wanted a little bit more training within that area of recognising, um, responding and referring for family violence disclosures. So we were able to organise that as well, which was a really important part of the training leading into the activities. So following the training, the houses were supported to each plan and run local conversations or activities. We linked them to videos, we gave them resources, we offered as mentors to attend and help facilitate any of the ac activities that they wanted to lead so that they, they were leading but we, were, we could support them in whatever way they needed. So across the region, the next stage past the activities was to promote the messages. And what we used as the clothesline project allowed us to use the image of a t-shirt. So people could share those messages. So they were locally derived messages, either through their social media or through, um, through physical clotheslines, which some of the houses put. So, okay, so what did the gender equality clothesline activities look like. So if you looked at a local level, they all actually looked quite different. So there were 16 different houses that participated and they all took a very localised approach. So the house featured in the photo on the right ran a week-long messaging project where all the community members attended their community house cafe. All of the houses that attended would get a free coffee um, 
if they did a gender equality clothesline activity and put a message. So you can see someone writing one of their messages. So there were videos showing the volunteers were trained up um, and it was a week long activity. So the house in the top left was a community development focused house. They had amazing relationships locally. And so they trained up some of their volunteers and staff to run their own activity as part of a women's network. Um, and the conversations that were generated in that were just quite, were, were incredible. Um, and then later on, they, they ran another activity during 16 days, which involved um, a woman firefighter, because there was a lot in the media that was um, around the, a woman who was pregnant and, and fighting fires. So they used that as a basis for starting up other conversations. And that story was just such a lovely story because out of that activity, there was an, a fantastic community newspaper article which led more community members to come into the house and have conversations. And because the house um, staff and volunteers have been trained, they were able to have even richer conversations. So it was a continually sort of reinforcing loop where people were having more and more local conversations. Um, and the one in the left down the bottom is about one of the houses ran a the clothesline activity that we'd taught them through the workshop, they ran it with the school and the class just found it such a powerful activity, so simple to run that they wanted to have another activity similar next year and to run it in some of their other local schools. So it built that connection with their local schools. Thanks, Olivia. Thanks, Catherine. So we wanted to explore the experiences of program workers who implemented the taking action in our community program. As no studies have previously investigated worker experiences um, of implementing a community mobilization program um, that prevents violence against women. So I really wanted to explore what things enabled or helped them in their role um, and what factors pose barriers or challenges? So things that would need to be worked on in the future implementation um, to strengthen sustainability in the long term. So as you see here on a thematic map, um, I generated three things that enabled the program workers to support community mobilization and three things that posed barriers to the program workers in their role. So the enabling themes were leveraging resources, making connections and feeling empowered. So leveraging resources such as having access to robust training, having adequately funded program activities, and also having access to informational resources were enablers that helped program workers in their role. The second enabler theme was making connections. And this theme encapsulated the importance of strengthening relationships. So workers credited their existing connections to community as a key success of the program and highlighted how well-placed the neighbourhood house settings are as trusted support entities for their communities. So creating a strong social environment for the group activities, such as running a, a morning tea or a supper, um, helped to balance the power dynamic in the room, so between themselves and the community members. The work has pointed to how a supportive environment um, helped the community members to feel safe in connecting with each other. The third enabling theme was around the workers feeling empowered in themselves. So it was clear from my interviews with the workers that their ability to support community mobilization and empower others, um, that was built on their own sense of personal power. So many described feeling a sense of duty to their communities and created engaging facilitation tools to help ignite action during their program activities. Program workers also felt empowered by the proactive culture in their community houses. So in addition to their role facilitating the activities, um, some workers described having initiated a gender audit. Um, so that's when you analyse community house operations and policies procedures with a gender lens. So changes implemented with the gender audit um, position the houses as prominent models of gender equitable practice. Um, and that contributed to the workers feeling empowered to mobilize the community. Um, now I'll go on to the barrier themes. So they were a perceived agenda, the one-off nature of the program and identifying impacts. So workers described how concerns of a perceived agenda were raised by the community members in several different ways 
including um, little effort to involve men in the activities, perceptions that the program disregarded male victim survivors, um, and perceptions that the program was underpinned by a man bashing agenda. So workers reported that despite their attempts to give clarity to the program's agenda, many community members still felt that the program promoted a one-sided narrative that belittled men. Um, so this theme really reflects the ongoing challenge in engaging men in, in gender equality work and how men can be left um, feeling alienated really quickly. The second barrier theme was one of nature of the program. So while many work workers reported success in engaging community members during the program, they also described that to their disappointment, um, the community's excitement and their, even their own momentum had decreased in the months following the program activities they run. So some of the workers reported believing that the program was only a one-off project. Um, and the lack of ongoing funding um, re reinforced workers' perceptions that the program was a one-off event. So the workers detailed to me that financial investment received as part of the program was a small one-off grant and that only served to support one to two activities. So, and, and some workers even said to me that they had intended to run additional activities to further mobilise community action. However, supplementary funding from, um, from sources outside of the program was really challenging for them to secure. So that theme really reflects how quickly efforts can come to a grinding halt um, when there's high competition for funding that's really already scarce. Um, and the last barrier theme is identifying impacts. So workers found it challenging to identify impacts of the program on their communities, um, either via formal evaluation or anecdotal evidence. Um, when, when asked in the interviews, the workers were also unable to communicate the aims of the program more broadly, and they felt quite uncertain about how to identify change. So I think this theme really reflects the difficulties that the workers experienced in really understanding um, project, pr like program logic um, and how goals set at the start of the program can be achieved. Um, notably, we believe our thematic findings provide insight into ways that health promotion organisations um, can support neighbourhood house settings to implement community-based um, prevention programs. We reinforce the importance of strengthening ties with neighbourhood houses and dismantling that power imbalance that remains present in health promotion efforts. While community-based programs, um, they cannot happen without the rigorous planning and evaluation support provided by health promotion organisations, it is of equal importance that implementers and facilitators from the neighbourhood houses, so those um, who have that existing and trusted connection on the front line to their communities, um, it's of equal importance that they are considered and that they are appropriately supported to bring about the change that's needed. So I think the key take home here is that both are important players in mobilising communities and that providing support to both parties is the key to successful mobilisation of communities. Importantly, the enablers indicate what, factor, what factors should continue to be funded to support the workers and the barriers indicate the factors that need work um, and they're the ones that can be turned around as opportunities to further strengthen support to the workers in the future. So I provide the following recommendations. Number one, um, ensure a stable and ongoing stream of funding to support the continued implementation of activities. The success achieved gives the snapshot of a community mobilization model in its first year. Um, and that hints at the potential to strengthen this work if funded for several more years. Particularly in this space, guaranteed multi-year funding is needed to resource the time that's needed for the gradual changes in gender norms to occur. Number two, establish more frequent training and support. So this may be achieved through the establishment of a community of practice, akin to the ones that are already facilitated by the Domestic Violence Resource Centre here in Victoria. Um, also, the workers will benefit from being connected to any professional networks, resources, webinar, um, all those that already exist for the prevention of family violence workforce. And number three, establish a stronger evaluation framework to measure the impact. So this should include um, an evaluation skills training workshop to equip program workers with simple tools that they can use to record anecdotal evidence of action and change. And lastly, 
Um, any recommendations from the growing evidence base regarding positive messaging of gender equity, as well as how to engage men and boys should be considered. There are already great resources out there, um, such as the Men in Focus report by Our Watch and the Framing Masculinities Guide by Big Health, both here in Australia. Also, the Momentum program that was discussed um, just pr prior to our presentation, um, that provides a great local example of how to engage and mobilise men in gender equality activism. So that concludes our presentation. So please do feel free to take a screenshot of the screen now if you'd like to note down the resources that we've mentioned in our presentation. Um, otherwise, Catherine will also be posting the link into the chat box for you to access now. So thank you for your time. Again, please take a screenshot of this screen as well if you'd like to contact us to find out more about preventing violence against women in neighbourhood house settings. I'll hand back to Peter, our facilitator. Thank you very much for that, Olivia. That was fantastic. Um, we've got about four or five minutes left for questions. I've got one uh, for you, Kim, from, mm -hmm. from Charlie. Um, so Charlie says, I'm wondering how you would overcome the discomfort of women in giving feedback to the men in the panel if you ran the project again. Um, yeah, I think um, it's a great question. Thanks, Charlie. I, I think a, a good way to move forward with that, I wouldn't avoid having them do it in person, but um, at, at the panel review, there were the, the young panel members and we also invited um, other women who work in the field. So women with a lot more experience and expertise. And I think moving forward, it would have been really good to have been able to pair up the young panel members with someone who has a lot more experience and, you know, they could work together. And that way the, uh, the younger women would be supported by um, the more experienced women. I think that would be a much more empowering model. Thanks, Kim. Um, please feel free, as I've said, to uh, write questions in the chat. I can't see any others, so I'll ask one while we're waiting for people. Um, sustainability of these projects is really critical. Often we get pilot funding or seed funding to start these projects off, but the, the next stage is so critical is keeping those going after we've learned all these lessons and invested all this time and, and effort into getting them up and running. So I'll throw this open to anyone who wants to answer. What tips would you have for others on getting sustainability embedded into the program so it can continue beyond the pilot project? Um, I, I'm happy to have got that and I wanted to ask Shanti to share her last um, her last slide that she didn't get to because I think it speaks okay. to it more broadly. Please. Um, please. But this the project that we worked on was very fortunate enough to get six years of funding um, which is which is substantial, and we did benefit both from the Commonwealth, um, from from Commonwealth funding and from state funding. So that was a good thing, but it's a struggle for everybody. One of the things I would like to emphasise is what Shanti says: if you've got a, and I think it's true for Catherine's project and for Kim's, if you've got a platform that is continuing then you can ramp up or ramp down your platform. So Playgroups for Diverse Families is a great pla platform, as, as are community houses, as, uh, as is um, working with, with local young activists. So I think, I think keep your platform going and try and get additional resources that will support good add-ons to, to that. Um, yeah, that's enough because there's other questions. That's okay. Um, so, Santi, do you want to just um, finish yep. the session off just by talking to that last sure. point that, that I... The one, the pretty, the pretty one. Yeah, I'll go to that. But before, before going to that one, I just wanted to quickly talk about um, this last thing, which is uh, we have currently collaborated with a community artist and are uh, engaging in this basket weaving workshop first with the facilitators now uh, while in the online space. And when we go face to face next year, uh, the idea is that they are able to do it with the families. Uh, so 
what the community artist uh, actually said is that basket weaving is a simple tool for containing conversation, promoting safety and setting up social conditions from which to work with trauma if it arises. And it also provides a vehicle to speak indirectly about difficult or unsafe topics through projection onto the weaving or to the basket itself. And uh, I'm really excited about it and I hope it goes well. I would like to leave you all with this uh, concluding slide, which I feel sort of wraps up all of our presentations, wherein it's by Vera Nazarene, and uh, she's a Russian-American Armenian writer and artist, and she says, a woman is human, she's not better, wiser, stronger, more intelligent, more creative, or more responsible than a man. Likewise, she's never less. Equality is a given. So that's exactly what we all are striving towards, what we all are trying to do in our individual projects. Thank you very much for all your time. Thank you so much. Uh, unfortunately for all of us, that's the uh, end of our, our time. So there's a couple of questions which we might get to um, afterwards. So apologies if we haven't got to your question tonight. We'll aim to um, get to it after the session. Thank you. Um, everyone could everyone please give a virtual round of applause for our um our stars of tonight um thank you so much for telling us about those projects and i hope that they they lead to long-term change that will prevent violence against many will, women uh, in the future so thank you all very much and thanks for everyone else who participated on the other side of the screen <laughs>